Greetings. I'm Bern Zampano. This is the Word of Faith Ministries International Miami Teaching of the Week. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves. Vessels for your use and yield now to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. The saints say in agreement, Amen. Amen. Satan, we bind you, all unholy seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, territorial spirits, elemental spirits, familiar spirits, uh, strong man spirits on assignment, all above, around, and below the strong man spirits, all of your works and efforts which we bind, uproot, curse at the roots, in decree, forbidden to ever seed, manifest, actualize, or realize. In the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus, and bind up and off all retaliations, counterattacks, judgment, wrath, revenge, or reprisals, in any way, manner, or form, to or through any individual organization, adversaries, or would-be adversaries, past, present, even as they arise, or to or through anyone, anywhere, at any time, in any manner, for any reason, by any means, for any purpose, in any way. And decree all such immediately, permanently, and perpetually forbidden. In the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus, and the saints say in agreement, Amen. 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 <clears throat> uh, in today's session... Uh, we want to uh, try to get to having a workshop uh, as we did in our last session, but this week's workshop is going to be on uh, altars, raising altars to call upon the name of the Lord, to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, these are basically altars of intercession, spiritual warfare, deliverance, and healing. And uh, they are of great import because they are extremely powerful. And I will give you an example of this uh, today as we uh, have a, a teaching before we actually uh, do some workshop work and uh, it will be a, a discussion of the prophet Elijah and his experience in raising an altar uh, against the prophets of Baal uh, spiritual warfare altar uh, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 but before we uh, get into that, let me just remind you of a few things. Uh, we've spoken of this before, but in way of a brief review. Uh, the reason we uh, are uh, moving into uh, the knowledge and use of altars and refreshing that from previous days is because as uh, we spoke in uh, our previous videos, uh, the Holy Spirit through Paul said that these things were given as examples to us. As examples to us. Well, things are given as examples for you to walk in, aren't they? For you to take possession of and apply to your own life. Why? God wants to bless you. God doesn't want you uh, bound to an altar of, of this or that. God wants you free. Scripture says he came to set the captives free. And one of the ways uh, spiritual warfare and deliverance can be performed is through the raising of godly altars against the enemy and the works of the enemy Okay, and the altars that we broke before, which were uh, demonic altars, going directly at them and breaking them. But we all have circumstances in our lives uh, where there are difficult 
situations. And uh, we need to see uh, uh, change. We need to see change effected uh, in our lives that we can get on with God. And the scripture shows us very clearly and in no uncertain terms that there are two ways of doing that. One, bind and break demonic altars, particularly demonic altars of witchcraft control or of witchcraft revenge. And we spoke about that in the previous broadcast. Uh, and or once we do that... Uh, also raising altars to call upon the name of the God, uh, the name of God for the healing and deliverance of our uh, family members or relatives or our circumstances, etc, uh, that were victimized by those altars or by generational hereditary influences such as generational curses. So we see in uh, the Old Testament scripture, which were given as examples to us, uh, that uh, there were two kinds of altars that were raised. One was called the altar unto the Lord. We spoke about that earlier. That was uh, the altar of covenant and intimacy that the patriarchs, the prophets, the kings, and the uh, 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 who am I forgetting? The uh, the patriarchs, the prophets, the kings, priests. and the priests. Thank you. Uh, and the priests uh, would call upon in their service to God, also their fellowship and intimacy with God. Today, that altar is in our hearts where Christ indwells our spirit man. huh? That's the holy of holies today. We are the tabernacle, the living tabernacle of God. And so Christ in us is uh, the Holy Spirit of that altar. And we fellowship directly and intimately with him uh, and have that altar to God now in our hearts. Now, we learn, however, from the scripture that uh, Abraham raised two kinds of altars. He raised altars to God that we just spoke of. But he also raised altars to call upon the name of the Lord. And these were altars uh, of uh, intercession, calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, these were altars that had to do with deliverance, with healing, with spiritual warfare with provision, uh, with protection, with, uh, pro, uh, 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 with the Lord uh, uh, being our banner. And so in understanding all of this, uh, we see that Abraham named them, as did other prophets such as Elijah, uh, not only that, but uh, he sacrificed on them. Every altar must have a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that empowers the altar. However, it is the altar that sanctifies the sacrifice. And we will talk more about that uh, as we uh, get into our teaching uh, uh, a little longer. And uh, we find that uh, altars were not only named, but uh, uh, some of the prophets spoke prophetic acts. Prophetic actions uh, were very common in the Old Testament. There's 16 
uh, verses in the Bible on prophetic acts. Fifteen are in the Old Testament. One is in the New Testament book of Acts. Uh, uh, where uh, Paul took authority over uh, all the occult books in a town and burned them in the square, if you remember, uh, as uh, a testimony, a prophetic testimony to the Lord that these things were destroyed. Now, there are 15 others in the Old Testament. We don't have time uh, to uh, get into the discussion of prophetic actions, uh, except to say that when they were done, God responded. God responded to the faith of those uh, who were uh, told to, or prompted to do a prophetic act. And we still see this work today. God says, I change not. And we're taking many of these things from Old Testament, but we're not keeping Old Testament law, are we? What we are doing is appropriating, taking possession of and applying the spirit of the word uh, that is behind the written word. The letter of the word kills, Jesus said. The spirit of the word gives life, and that's why we do it. We are going after the life of the Spirit in the rhema revelation of what these things signify and what these things mean today. Altars are not done away with in the New Testament, contrary to what some argue. Uh, uh, we see uh, Jesus uh, speaking of them in, in uh, Matthew 5, 23 and 24, and uh, uh, Matthew 9.13, we see uh, altars uh, in the heavenly realm in the book of Revelation of the New Testament, and we even see the angels of those altars, uh, which shows us that altars are operated by angels or messengers of God, which is why the prophets of the Old Testament spoke to them. Uh, and uh, 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 so we see even in, in the heavenly realm uh, that altars were active, very active, and that uh, when God would speak, an angel was released to go and do something on the earth. So... Uh, It's very interesting that uh, although the first altar uh, known in Scripture was built by Noah at the end of the flood, an altar of praise and thanksgiving, an altar unto the Lord, it isn't until you uh, go into Genesis uh, chapter 4, verse 25 and 26, that we read that uh, Seth, the son of Adam, the third son, uh, or not the third, the second son of Adam, because Cain was not a son of Adam, uh, uh, that Seth uh, begat, he gave birth to uh, Enos, or Enosh. Okay, in the Hebrew it's really Anush. But, but uh, he gave birth to uh, Enosh, and uh, Enosh's name, interestingly, meant man, generic man. Uh, also, uh, by implication, uh, mankind. And that's very, very interesting because when you read that remark in Genesis uh, 4, verse 25 uh, and 26, it says, uh, that after he begat Enosh, that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And that was the beginning of it. And then as we go on through the Old Testament, we see more and more uh, uh, of uh, 
altars being built where uh, the prophets and the kings and the patriarchs and the priests began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, probably the most famous uh, altar that was uh, used to call upon the name of the Lord in the Bible is the altar that Elijah built to the Lord uh, in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, uh, you're welcome to turn there uh, with me, uh, if you will. And uh, let's look at Elijah's work at Mount Carmel. It's very, very interesting. Here he was building an altar to call upon the name of the Lord. He was dealing with King Ahab. Uh, Jezebel, the queen of Israel, who was a foreigner, whose father was the high priest uh, of uh, Baal or Baal in Babylon, uh, and who had brought that uh, worship and the worship of the Asherah uh, into Israel. And it was spreading like wildfire. And there were these... Uh, uh, Asherah up on uh, cliffs and, and uh, groves uh, in the hills and the mountains throughout Israel. And there were sacrifices being made by uh, the priests of Baal. And there were 450 prophets of Baal that were under the charge of Queen Jezebel. And uh, Elijah was sent to confront King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and the 450 prophets uh, of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. And so if you turn with me uh, to verse 20, 1 Kings 18 verse 20. And let's look at what happened at Mount Carmel. Read along with me if you will. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, that was the altar. But put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood. And I will not put a fire under it. Then you call upon the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. <laughs> Little did they know what was waiting for them. <laughs> That's not part of this word, by the way. <laughs> okay. So in verse 25, we continue. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal, from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar that which they made, 
It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside, or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. <laughs> so they cried with a loud voice and they cut themselves. Uh, mutilation was, uh, self-mutilation by priests was a common practice among several pagan religions of those days. Uh, I suppose it was akin to blood sacrifice since Satan counterfeits everything uh, that uh, uh, God does. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. You see, there had previously been at this site an altar that had been built to the Lord. And it had been abandoned, and it had been disassembled. Probably in ancient times, we don't know by whom. But Elijah rebuilt the altar. He took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Notice again, like some of the other uh, Old Testament patriarchs, uh, Elijah spoke to the altar and he named the altar. These are altars to God. Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers of water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. He killed all 450 prophets of Baal. Now Elijah said to Ahab, Go up. He's the evil king of Israel, northern, uh, the northern kingdom. He said, now go up, eat and drink, 
For there is the sound of a roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth, put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go back seven times. See, this is a prophetic act. It came about at the seventh time that he said, Behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went to Jezebel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. Can you imagine? He went faster than the chariot. Now, this is a perfect example of calling upon the name of the Lord. Notice that what he did. He built an altar. He named the altar. He told the people what its purpose was. That the fire will fall on him who is God. By him who is God. He is God. And what happened? A blessing came forth from it. The people's hearts were turned by the thousands back to the God of Israel away from the God of Baal. So evil King Ahab and his nasty wife Jezebel, the crown witch of Israel, were shamed by Elijah and discredited as was her religion that she brought into Israel. What do we learn from this? We learn, now watch this, listen up, what is a blessing for the people of God through an altar raised to call upon the name of the Lord will be a curse upon the kingdom of darkness. They were destroyed. The power of God through the altar destroyed them. And this is true of all altars that are raised to call upon the name of the Lord in Scripture. And so we learn from this story the magnificent power of the Holy Spirit to respond to the words of those who call upon his name. Very, very important. Yes, it's true. Elijah was a man of authority. He was empowered. He was a prophet. He was the oracle of the Father. But today, guess what? We are empowered. It's very clear in the New Testament. The scripture says... We are a prophetic people. Paul said, I, uh, I mentioned this I think in the last session or the session before, that Paul said the oracles uh, were given us by God to speak them, to release them. And we spoke about how that's done and we'll touch on it briefly as we raise... Uh, and altar today. And so we learn from all of this 
that we are empowered as New Testament people, a prophetic people. You see, in typology of Scripture, Elijah is a type of you and me, what we should be in the kingdom of God. And in this end time, God will be raising people with the spirit of Elijah to come forth in holy boldness to start tearing down these altars and uh, these uh, Asherahs and everything else that are presently being built up nationwide in preparation for rise of Antichrist who is on the earth now, is an adult, and is preparing to come to power. There already has been established in New York City an altar to Baal in Times Square. There is an altar to Baal that has been erected in St. Louis, Missouri. There is an altar to Baal that has been erected uh, in Los Angeles, California. And there is another altar to Baal that has been erected in a nearby city in California. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I've forgotten where it was, but I think it's San, San Diego. All of those altars to Baal that have been raised have a purpose in the kingdom of darkness. But they are coming down through the prayers of the saints. And God is going to give the victory. And we have to participate. And how will the victory be obtained? Will it be with swords and knives and guns? No. No, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So, will you have to do the battle personally? Not necessarily. We can build altars to call upon the name of the Lord for national issues and problems. Not just personal. For cultural issues and problems, not just personal. And not only that, we don't have to make it our individual personal war. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that the war has to be our war. It says repeatedly, the battle is the Lord's. It is God's war. All we are is empty vessels using words as the oracle of the Father, as we said in the two previous sessions. So if you understand that and you know that, then you'll realize that all we have to do is to decree and declare and invite and command warrior angels of the Lord Christ Jesus to go forth in whatever number of legions necessary to do this or that, ministering angels to go forth in whatever number of legions necessary to do this or that in the name of the Lord Christ Jesus and according to his purpose and especially according to what he witnesses to you or to me in our spirits as the first mouth of the double mouth sword. Remember that teaching? Revelations 1.16 of Christ. Out of his mouth comes the two-edged sword, it says. Go to the original Greek. It doesn't say two-edge. It says double mouthed. What is this sword? It's a spiritual thing. And it's made up of two mouths. And the first mouth is that of the Lord. And the second mouth is yours or mine. And how is it done? 
His spirit witnesses to our spirit. Romans 8.16 That we are the sons of God. We have an authority in him. We are one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6.17 We are seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 2.6 So we have a position in Christ. We have an authority in Christ. We have empowerment in Christ. The kingdom of God is within you. Actually, the literal Greek says the kingdom of God is in you. We'll get into that momentarily. So, we have an Elijah anointing when we are born again. So here's Elijah, all by himself, surrounded by thousands of people in Israel. On the top of a rugged mountain, standing out by himself against all these people, Standing in defiance of uh, uh, King Ahab, who was essentially a Casper milk toast. He uh, uh, was a very weak husband, passive type husband, and who had. Uh, a wife, a witch hack named Jezebel, who was very aggressive and wanted to run the nation of Israel in his place. And he was so passive that he abdicated the throne essentially and backed off and just let her run the nation just to shut her up. That's the kind of life he lived. So, there's the defiant 450 prophets of Baal and of the Asherah, a compromised king, a loudmouth hack, wicked witch woman, his wife, huh? and the people. And everyone's against them. But God. But God. And Elijah said, Answer me, answer me, O Lord. And show them who is the God of Israel. And boy, did they get a revelation. A revelation that brought transformation. You see, when you get a revelation from an altar to call upon the name of the Lord, it is certain to bring transformation not only in your life, but in the life of others. There is going to be a transformation. Remember uh, in previous teachings, one of the things I said is that when we uh, place sacrifice on the altar... And God, sac God sanctifies that altar and empowers the sacrifice. That that power of the altar not only goes forth to do what you have assigned that altar to do, but it also comes back into you. You become empowered. Also, and the degree to which you become empowered is going to be proportional to the sacrifice that you put on the altar. And we'll talk about that momentarily also. So, the altar, whether it's an altar to God, or whether it's an altar to call upon the name of the Lord, an altar of intercession for spiritual warfare, healing, deliverance, uh, provision, uh, etc. 
whichever it is, both will be empowered by the Spirit of God. And as we learn uh, from the book of Revelation, an angel will be assigned by God to operate that altar and to carry out uh, the benefits. Now, let's talk, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about empowerment, if we may. Let's dispel some ideas first. First idea, I'm not holy enough to do these things. God says you are because you don't have any holiness of your own. You have his righteousness credited to you and to your account in heaven. So Paul, the apostle by the Holy Spirit, said, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. In Christ. Without those last two words, I'm not righteous. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So, Let's go through this one more time uh, quickly so that you can feel confident in what you're going to do if you're going to use uh, this knowledge. <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, Bern, if all this stuff is really true, how come other people are not doing it? They are. That's how you know this is the Holy Spirit's move across the earth in the end times. There are ministries teaching altars and raising altars and teaching people to do so in all parts of the world. And some of the stuff that's being taught isn't too accurate. I'm, it's unfortunate to say. <clears throat> so, what we're saying is, this is one of the fulfillments of the prophecy of Gabriel to the prophet Daniel in the last chapter of the book of Daniel. In the last days, there will be an increase in knowledge. That includes spiritual knowledge. See, you get some religious folks and they say, oh, the only divine revelation uh, is the word of God. And you can't go outside uh, of the covers uh, of the uh, book of the Bible because that's the only divinely inspired revelation that there is. That's a doctrine right from the pit of hell. That is a religious spirit talking. May I remind you that in the four, first 450 years of the early church there was no Bible and everything was by direct revelation from the Spirit relating to the Spirit of God alone and teaching by word of mouth. The first Bible, the canon of books that make up our Bible today, uh, did not exist until 450 A.D. There were manuscripts like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Gospel of Matthew was written down uh, uh, around uh, 58 A.D. and the book of Revelation, uh, 90 A.D. But, but, and there were some epistles, etc. But there was no full New Testament text 
uh, and no full Old Testament text. Uh, uh, other than, uh, by the way, uh, the Septuagint, as far as the Old Testament went. The Masoretic text, which is in everybody's Old Testament, which is everybody's Old Testament today, wasn't completed until uh, about 600 to 900 A.D. by Masorite scribes living in Poland. So what uh, was it that brought the church and its growth through all of those hundreds of years before we actually had Bibles in the hands of most believers through the Gutenberg Press? The answer to that was the Holy Spirit teaching and directly bringing revelation to the believers of those ages. There is no other answer. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is bringing revelation today, isn't he? If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you're born again, you will have direct revelations of the Holy Spirit. And some might say, well, burn, wait a minute now. You may get those revelations, but uh, those revelations are, are not in the Bible. Well, I have a word for you. Neither is the word Bible in the Bible. <laughs> and I have another word for you also. Neither is the word Trinity in the Bible. But do you deny that God is three in one? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Three manifestations of one Godhead? Do you deny that? That's a matter of divine revelation. So, here's how you're empowered. Are you ready? You have a position in Christ. You have a delegated authority in Christ. And you are empowered by Christ. Revelations 1.6 says, You are a king and priest unto your God. That's Melchizedek priesthood. Because Hebrews says that Christ is high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And that Melchizedek, the Holy Spirit, is priest unto the Most High God. Huh? Only priesthood in Scripture that is a priesthood after the Spirit. All the other priesthoods in Scripture are priesthoods after the flesh. And Jesus said in John 3, 5, the things of the Spirit are spirit and the things of the flesh are flesh. It is the Spirit that quickens. It is the spirit that gives life. So your purpose in raising these altars is to bring life and change to others as well as self. Hebrews 1.14 says of the angels, are they not ministering spirits sent to minister for us, not just to us, for us, on our behalf. Do a word study of that, and you'll discover it means to, on our behalf, to carry out commands. It's a very interesting word study. They are there waiting for our commands. And most Christians are working at half power, if that. 
So I hope that this will inspire you to move up to another level and to start learning these things, applying them, and watching them work. Be patient. Be persistent. Don't let the devil discourage you. Some people will work their altars over a very long period of time, but breakthrough will come. And the beauty of this type of spiritual warfare is that you can name your altar and you can give the, uh, the spirit of the altar, the angel of that altar, uh, its assignments. That is what you want him to carry out. Okay, you cannot use altars for uh, revenge to harm others. That's witchcraft. You cannot use altars for uh, wild and crazy things that are not in line with the word of God. But do you have authority? Yes. Can you use commands of authority? Uh, for the benefit of others? Yes. Or for self? Yes. That's in line with the word of God. So your commands must be in line with the word of God. Now, with that understanding, let's just quickly run through these three principles. You have a position in Christ. You have... Uh, an authority in Christ and you have power in Christ you must know who you are in Christ you must use the power you must use the authority you must use your position so let's look Ephesians 2 6 you have a position in Christ it reads and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? That when you raise altars, when you speak, when you minister, you are to minister from heavenly places. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's possible... It's, it's possible because 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, He who is Christ is one spirit. And some of your translations say one spirit with him. In the original Greek, it says one spirit. What does that mean? It means that when you are in Christ, you are in covenant. You are one spirit with his spirit. See, the deal that Christ made with you when you got born again was you give me your life, I'll give you my life. That's the deal. Hey, great deal, isn't it? A changed life for an exchanged life. Did you get that? A changed life for an exchanged life. So you surrender and you give Christ your life and commit to the faith walk and receive his salvation. And he begins to live his life in you and through you. So Paul, by the Spirit, says in Acts 17, 28, in him I live and move and have my being. In him I live and move and have my being. My being, my existence. So it is because of this covenant in his blood which imparts his life to my life, my spirit. I am one spirit with him. So yes, my spirit is in my physical body here on the earthly level, but my spirit is already seated with him 
in heavenly places. That's a matter of divine revelation. So, when his voice, the first voice of the double-mouthed sword, witnesses to my spirit, Romans 8.16, that I am a son of God, I have the DNA of God, activated by Christ when he generated me out of him. And the same for all of you. The word born again comes from the Greek verb geneo, which means generated out of. Or begotten. It says Christ was begotten of the Father, the scripture says. That means generated out of the Father. And we were generated out of Christ, Geneo. We have that DNA. We are sons of God. We are seated in heavenly places. We have a position in Christ. We are the oracles of Christ. In Revelation 1.16 we read, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. No, in the original Greek, double-mouthed sword. He's the first mouth, you are the second mouth. You were generated out of him and you are the oracle of Christ to people on the earth. Know who you are in Christ. Wake up, church. This is not playing, church. This is being, church. Bringing the power of the kingdom to the earth today. God doesn't call you to be a member of the church of the chosen frozen. He calls you to call down the fire and to set Holy Spirit fires here and there across the earth that will kindle a revival with the Elijah spirit on you. And you're going to do it with holy boldness. Put your hand out right now on the screen, please. You folks out there, everyone here. And touch my hand on the, uh, on the screen. Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, I just impart holy boldness right now to every viewer and to everyone here holy boldness in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus so be it in Christ Jesus name yes yes Holy Spirit fire fall on these folks Holy Spirit fire fall on the viewers in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus move them Holy Spirit Rise up in them, Holy Spirit. Anointing flow in Christ Jesus' name. Adiyasha palakala bashandele. Rakushweta malosoka karabashandele. Arabasa shamalahande. Kemusha sandele. Ariakwaba. Saribieta toro. So the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are. The sons of God. Say, we are the sons of God. Amen. Position in Christ, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, listen up. The life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. Some of your translations say the faith in the Son of God. No, 
that's salvation faith. Faith in Iran Christ is salvation faith. No, the correct translation is, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's all about love. God empowers. He is in the process of making you and me like he is. That's what Paul said in the scripture. And how is it done? The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Or the God kind of faith. The God kind of faith. That's what that means. By the faith of the Son of God. What is the faith of the Son of God? We've been through this before. It's the trust that the Father had on himself that when he released words from his mouth, those words found their target and did what he intended. Carried out the intention of what those words were that were spoken. That's the faith that God has, the faith of God. That once he released the words, they did what he intended. Now Jesus was creator, you know that. John 1 says that. And in Genesis 1 where he created, it says, and God said, nine times, and God said, and it was, and God said, and it was, and notice he kept moving on. He just released the words. He didn't bother to stand and look and say, let's see if it really happens. Uh, no. He knew when he released the words that they would do what he intended. So he just kept moving. Didn't think about it. Released the words. Backed them by faith that they would do what he intends. That's the faith of God. You use that kind of faith. All of you. I use that kind of faith. Why? Because in John 14, 12, Jesus said, The things I do, you will do. And greater things than these shall you do, for I go to the Father. Something to think about, huh? Say, I must do the things that Jesus does. I didn't hear you. I must do the things that Jesus does. I must think the way that Jesus thinks. See? Very important. That's the covenant deal. Okay? Okay, so you have a position in Christ. Now watch this. You have an authority in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Corinthians 6.17 But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Romans 8.16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are sons of God. Acts 2.17, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Well, 
Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Well, I'm 78, but I don't dream dreams, but I see visions, so I must be young. All agree? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ephesians 1.5. He predestined us. Here's a lousy translation. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Ho, oh, wait a minute. He predestined us to adoption. Adoption, we're kin. We're generated out of him. We have his DNA. That's what John 3.3 3 says. And that's what John 3.5 says. We are descended directly out of him. We are sons of God by DNA. We have his DNA. That's a matter of divine revelation. So when you say adoption, that doesn't imply a blood relationship, does it? I mean, there may be bonding and true father-son, mother-son or daughter relationships because spirits bond together, right? And we are spirits, okay? But as far as the physical goes, uh, adoption uh, does not uh, imply kinship, does it? Because the adopted person has a different bloodline than the parents who adopted him. So if you do a word study in the Greek, guess what? You discover that the word adoption isn't even there in the Greek. That's that spirit, that demonic spirit, that religious spirit of subver subversive revisionism. It revises the scriptures and waters down the wording with every uh, new Bible that comes out. That's part of the warfare. The spirit of subversive revisionism. See? Notice how the churches uh, today are revising their doctrinal positions. Huh? Okay? Doctrinal positions. Okay. Ed anything goes, everything goes, let them come into the church. Whatever it is. Say, what is that? The spirit of subversive revisionism. So we have the authority of the spirit poured out upon us. Now let's look at empowerment. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Oh, okay. Luke 17, 20, 21. Nor having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he, that is Jesus, answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is in you. So you have power. Because where the kingdom is, the spirit is. Where the spirit is, the power is. And where the power is, the anointing is. So the kingdom, the spirit, the power, and the anointing move in parallel. Hmm. 
moron power. Luke 10, 17. The apostles ran to Jesus and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Well, authority over all the power of the enemy would include Satan, wouldn't it? See, most people spend their time running from Satan. This verse says you should be running at him. He has no power against the believer. His power was taken from him at the cross by Christ. He's got all sorts of powers against unbelievers, but not against believers. And you say, well, how come uh, so many believers uh, get hurt by him? Everything he does, he does by lies and deception. If you don't want to learn spiritual warfare, you're going to get bruised. It's going to be worse in the end time. Because Satan is going to try to do as much damage to the church as he possibly can, knowing that his time is short. It's a wake-up call. And there are very few pastors out there, I might add, who are willing to teach their congregations spiritual warfare. As long as I'm at it, let me just say something. If you want to learn spiritual warfare, go to our website at walkinginpower.org all one word, lowercase letters, no spaces or dots walkinginpower.org O-R-G you'll come to the home page scroll uh, up or down the home page until you see the word PowerPoint presentations click on it and it will take you directly to the PowerPoint section of our website where there are free downloads of complete uh, courses on spiritual warfare. There are several of them there. Uh, and you can look at those slides, maybe 10 or 15 slides a day till you get through them. And when you start reviewing and applying, you'll see that you'll have a very good foundational knowledge of spiritual warfare. And we hope they'll be a blessing to you. Okay. So, how else are we empowered? Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Why are we doing this? I'm trying to show you the scriptures behind what's going to empower your altar. So you'll have confidence. See? So life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those who engage it will eat the fruit thereof. Fruit comes from seed. The power of the tongue is to release seed. And the seed released by the power of the tongue are faith-filled words Delivered under the anointing after you've praised and worshipped to put sacrifice on your altar. See how it works? So, the seed released are faith-filled words. Once released to the atmosphere, those words find their target and the happening is in the words. Isn't that something? How do you know that, Byrne? Well, I read the Bible. And in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel was praying for release from Babylon. And the angel Gabriel came to him and said to him, Daniel, from the first day your words were heard. Really? 
Where were the words heard? In heaven. How could that possibly be? Words are spiritual. There's no time or distance in the spirit realm. So words go directly to their target. Faith-filled words. So Romans 10.8 says, The word is near you, even in your mind and heart. Remember, his spirit witnesses to our spirit. Huh? And we speak it out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. See how it's worked? How it comes together? Everything's scriptural. All you have to do is apply it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what kind of word? The word of faith which we speak, Paul says in Romans 10.8. Wow. The word of faith that we speak. Romans 10.8. So it's in the power of the tongue. That's the key. The power of your tongue is the key. In line with God's word and God's will. Luke 17, 6, And the Lord said, If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to the mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea. It would obey you. It would obey you. Say, what is Jesus saying? With faith-filled words, your circumstances should obey you, and not you, your circumstances. That's what he was saying. You are empowered. Psalm 103.20 Bless the Lord, you his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, with a small c meaning his teachings, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Listen to that last phrase. Angels responding, hearkening is old English, responding to, unto, the voice of his word. What is the voice of his word? It's his word, which comes out of his mouth, as the first mouth of the double mouth sword, and then comes to you, and is repeated and released out of your mouth, as the second mouth of the double mouth sword, and the angels respond to the voice of his word. See? Because all your being, according to what Paul says, is an oracle speaking what the Father says, speaking his word. Angels respond. That's what makes altars work. Psalm 103, verse 20. And then John 14, 12, Jesus said, The works that I do, you'll do also. The greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. And how are we empowered? According to our faith. Matthew 9, 29, Jesus said, it shall be done to you according to your faith. Need a lot of faith? No. Just mustard seed faith. As I said before, mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds in existence. And out of it comes uh, one of the biggest trees in existence. And all that the tree is, is in the seed. Say, And it's a very small seed. So if you think you have very small faith, release it anyway. It'll work. You see, Jesus will meet you at your own level of faith. That's what grace is. Huh? He'll meet you at your own level of faith. See, 
and he will encourage you. And the more you start seeing results, and it may take some time, be persistent. Do not have wavering faith. Remember, God performs his word. And in James 1, verse 6 and 7, the Lord said through James, uh, let not... Uh, uh, the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, he said. Huh? What was he talking about there? Wavering faith. Don't have wavering faith. Have steadfast faith. Just stand. Walk by faith and not by sight. When the devil comes and says in your thoughts, Oh, this isn't really true. This stuff doesn't really work. Your response should be, no devil, I'm not going there anymore. Huh? That's how you respond. So you're going to have to use your faith. And it's going to be words backed by faith. You have to be convicted that you have the authority, you have the empowerment, you have the position in Christ, and you have the knowledge. And you're a prophetic people. Okay. The next thing before we start, and we're going to do an altar, the next thing before we start is let's talk about the sacrifice. Every altar has to have a sacrifice. Now, uh, Jesus said in John uh, 3.6, the things of the spirit are spirit. The things of the flesh are flesh. You'll see a lot of videos on television talking about altars, this and that. And they'll talk about uh, uh, putting something on the altar uh, that uh, uh, is meaningful to you. Like you may make a vow on an altar. Yeah, you can do that. That's a thing of the spirit. Okay, or you may make a pledge uh, for some purpose or another uh, that might cost you uh, a financial commitment that you really can't afford. Well, that's a thing of the spirit. Okay, but are those things absolutely necessary? Not really. Uh, and the reason is this. If you adhere to the doctrine that the things of the Spirit are spirit, and if you adhere to the Word of God, let's look at what New Testament sacrifice is. A lot of those things were patterned after Old Testament sacrifice. Do they still work? I presume they do, because there are people that get results. Okay, but why not do it the new and better way according to New Testament revelation? Let's look at it. Okay, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Romans 6.13, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Hebrews 13.15, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that give thanks to his name. Now isn't that something? So we are to bring the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Uh, we can bring 
uh, uh, the sacrifice of worship. Uh, we can bring the sacrifice uh, of honoring the Lord uh, 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 through song or, uh, or music. Uh, we can bring uh, the sacrifice of praying in tongues where the Holy Spirit prays a perfect prayer in you and through you. You make the sounds, he gives the meanings. It says in the scripture. Or if you don't pray in tongues, you can use praise. Praising God for this and that, etc. That he thinks he's doing in your life. Why? Because praise does everything that tongues does. Old Testament scripture refers to praise as the perfect prayer. God inhabits the praise, Old Testament scripture says. It brings God's presence. So what we know then is that if we do this kind of sacrificing, that will be an altar of power. And then you just keep uh, doing it. It doesn't have to be long periods of time. You can do sh short periods of time, maybe several minutes, uh, or whatever the Spirit of God leads. Uh, and maybe just once a day, or twice a day, or maybe four or six times a day. As a general rule of thumb, you will see that the more sacrificing you do, the quicker will you get the result. And I told you before, you can have multiple altars going at the same time. And if you do that, make sure uh, that uh, you um, have a, a ledger or a notebook present where you record the altar, its name, its purpose, and its instructions or uh, commands. Okay? So, <clears throat> with that, let's get into uh, a little bit of workshop time here. And I'm going to uh, sh give you a demonstration first. And then uh, we're going to uh, use that model to uh, show you how to uh, do it on your own. Okay? So let's use an illustration. Uh, we'll use, say, uh, an illustration uh, of um, addiction to cigarettes. A lot of heavy smokers out there. Aren't there? A lot of heavy smokers, starting even as a, at a young age. Do you have high school children who are smoking? Mom, dad, and they don't want to listen to you? Any kind of addiction. Taking drugs or etc. Okay. Let's say that... Uh, there's a boy named uh, uh, Bobby. Just no one in particular, but Bobby. Bobby's got a, he's in high school. He's got a problem with smoking. He smokes about one and a half, two packs of cigarettes a day. Wants to feel accepted by his peers. And uh, has gotten to like it. His body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he's harming the temple of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't care. He's not mature enough to understand all the ramifications 
of what these things can do to ravage the body, etc. And he needs a little help from God, a little persuasion from God. Okay? So here I am, and I'll be Bobby's father in this situation. And so here is what I do. Father God, I acknowledge you this day. I enter your gates with thanksgiving. I enter your courts with praise. I present myself to you, Father. And uh, I yield to your Holy Spirit to divinely possess me and speak to me and through me as the second mouth, uh, as the first mouth of the double mouth sword, that I may be used. Uh, as the second mouth of the double mouth sword to construct this altar. I yield to your Holy Spirit now and I trust you for the results. All in your name. By the faith of God in Christ Jesus' name. Father, I erect in the Spirit, I raise up an altar to call upon the name of the Lord on behalf of Bobby. And I speak to that altar now. Altar, by the faith of God in Christ Jesus' name, I give you the name of permanent deliverance from cigarettes or other addictions in Bobby, my son, or Robert, my son. That is your name. Secondly, the purpose. The purpose of the altar, of, of, of your existence, is to effect change and deliverance permanently from addiction. These are the commands to carry out. And I thank you for your uh, service and for your cooperation. Remember, you're speaking to the angel of the altar, huh? Okay, really. <clears throat> Number one, cut off Bobby's uh, financial sources for cigarettes. Number two, minister disinterest to his soul man. And bring him a revelation of the harm that he is doing to his body. Number three. Minister a desire for change in him. Number four. Give him experiences that will bring him to an end of self. Number five, minister to his thought life to take an interest in God. Number six, whenever he smokes, Give him a symptom that will uh, disquiet him and develop in him a dislike for cigarettes that he won't want it anymore. Number seven, show him signs for good as he begins to obey. Okay, now as a little sideline, uh, I'll tell you about why I 
uh, said, give him a symptom when he smokes. Because the Lord did that to me. When I was a very young man, I used to smoke a pipe. <clears throat> I walked into a drugstore and I bought some pipe tobacco. I used to smoke six to eight pipefuls a day. I was in my late teens, early 20s in college. And one day I bought a pouch of tobacco and I got in my car, I took three or four puffs and all of a sudden I was overwhelmed with this incredible nausea. And I had to stop smoking the pipe and put it down. I said, where is this nausea coming from? Oh, I better put this aside and maybe I'll try later tonight. And that was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. About 8, 9 at night, I lit up again. And this tremendous nausea came on me. And I didn't know what to do. So I didn't smoke for the rest of the day. The next day, I lit up my pipe. Nausea. I waited till the afternoon. Nausea again. I waited till the evening. Nausea again. And it got to the point where I was almost ready to vomit. So I waited a third day. And the third day, the same thing happened. And I waited a fourth day. And the fourth day, the same thing happened. And the fifth day, I realized I can't smoke anymore. What happened? The angel was ministering to my thought life. Say. And this was a sovereign altar God raised for me because I didn't know about altars back then. And I just put it away and I never went back to smoking. April 6th, 1969, the last day I smoked. See? And it was all done supernaturally. That is the power of an altar. Sometimes God will raise altars for you. Anybody ever experienced that? See? Yeah. You too. Good. Yeah. Sometimes God will raise altars for you. Okay? So then what do you do? Now, I've given the instructions to the uh, angel of the altar. Huh? All right, that's my liberty in Christ. According to Psalm 103, verse uh, 20. Huh? According to Job 22, 28. I'm giving you the scriptures. Huh? According to Proverbs 18, 21. I'm using all my empowerments to use my authority. And then I say to the spirit of the altar, the sacrifice I place on you to empower this altar is going to be uh, thanksgiving, praise, glory, honor, worship, uh, and tongues. And then I... Uh, even if you don't start immediately, shortly after, just go to the altar and say, uh, Father, I come to the altar raised uh, in, in your name for Bobby to place a sacrifice. And you say that every time you're going to place a sacrifice. Okay? The Holy Spirit... The seal spirit of the altar will then uh, sanctify the altar and the sacrifice according to the word of God. Okay? And by so doing, the number of times you continue to do it on a daily basis, all right, you will continually empower that altar until you see the result. And you'll pray uh, uh, to the Lord. Lord, I come to the altar for so and so. 
in the name of Christ Jesus uh, to uh, place a sacrifice. Uh, in my own personal life, almost every day uh, in the mornings, uh, I do that in my office and I have uh, a uh, uh, praise and worship session, a, a brief praise and worship session. And then during the day I may tell the Lord I'm empowering these altars with tongues. Perfect prayers. See, the things of the Spirit are spirit. Use the things of the Spirit for your uh, sacrifices. That's the important point. See? And when you do these things, okay, it's just going to be a matter of time before you see results. Okay? So that's one example of how to raise an altar. Now, let me ask you and you folks out uh, in the audience. Uh, let's work an altar raising uh, uh, in your own personal lives for your own personal needs. Huh? And uh, if you have, how many people know a specific change of circumstance that's needed in their family or in their lives that uh, they want to pray for? Can you raise your hands? Okay, just about everybody, okay? And I'm sure you folks uh, in the uh, television audience the same. So think of something that's uh, been a problem in the family for a very long period of time and that really is, it, it's, uh, uh, bears down on everyone and there's really a need for change, whatever that thing is, okay? And then I will ask you to name it. All right? So pray along with me now and let's raise an altar to call upon the name of the Lord uh, for an intercession uh, to end these things. And just say these words, Father, in Christ Jesus' name, I enter your gates with thanksgiving. I enter your courts with praise. And uh, I give you thanks, praise, glory, honor, and worship for who you are. One with the Lord Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I bless your name. Father, I yield to your Holy Spirit to divinely possess me as the second mouth of the double mouth sword. And I ask you, your Holy Spirit, to be the first mouth of the double mouth sword. And I yield now to be your oracle in Christ Jesus' name by the faith of God, in Christ's name, amen. Now, Father, I come to raise an altar to call upon your name on behalf of, now say the person's name, for the problem of, Tell the Lord what the problem is. By the faith of God in Christ Jesus' name. And by the faith of God in Christ Jesus' name, I decree all of the following. Altar, your name is Speak the name. Anything the Lord leads you. So you've yielded to the Holy Spirit. So you're going to just trust that what he puts on your mind and heart is of, of him. Okay? And now say, 
altar. Your purpose is. Okay, now speak the purpose. That is the result you want to see. Okay. Now the third thing. Altar. Uh, these are the things that I would like you to carry out. Okay. Now tell him, uh, number one, what it is you want uh, the angel to do. Number two, what you want them to do. It doesn't have to be in any particular order. And you can always go back whenever you're uh, going to uh, uh, place uh, a sacrifice, continual sacrifice on the altar. You can always speak to the altar and add commands if you need to. Number three, what else do you want? Number four, there's someone out there, the Holy Spirit is telling me you are praying for someone in particular who has a hardened heart, a hardened heart, and is resistant to the things of the Holy Spirit. Make sure that you include in your command uh, by the Holy Spirit Give him a heart of flesh where there is a heart of stone. And the person out there will know who I'm talking to. And it might be more than one person. Okay, number four. Give your command. Number five, give your command. <clears throat> if there's a sixth command, give it now. It varies. You can also raise the altar on behalf of someone. If you're not sure of the name that you want to give it, you can always uh, give it that name in the next session. God is not a legalist. Where there is Christ, there is liberty. Okay. Now let's continue to pray. And say, Father, I place on this altar the sacrifices of and the name which you're going to be using for sacrifices presenting your body, presenting a thanksgiving praise and glory, Hebrews 13, 15, uh, 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 presenting your members as instruments of righteousness, uh, pre uh, tongues, whatever it is that you place on that altar. And then tell the Lord, and I will sacrifice on this altar regularly to empower it. 
on a daily basis. And I give you thanks, praise, and glory. Altar. Say altar. altar. Go forth now. And uh, effect these things to the glory of the Father. By the faith of God. In Christ Jesus' name, I bind Satan from all retaliations, counterattacks, judgments, wraths, revenge, reprisals, in any way, manner, or form. From this day, any day past, any day to come, and decree all such forbidden in the name of and by the blood of Christ Jesus. So be these things. Amen. Okay. Now, let me give you an example. Let's do build a third altar. Okay. And this one is going to be an altar... Uh, where uh, you're going to fight for someone's welfare. Okay? Let's use, for instance, uh, someone who's a drug addict and doesn't want to give up his drugs. Okay? But he's sick and uh, he or and or even dying. Okay? So, uh, let's uh, n name this uh, uh, a person at the altar who is being raised. I'll name him Freddie. Now, you folks out there, if you have a real-life situation, you use the real-life name of the person we're going to raise this altar to. Okay? And, or for and uh, I'm going to show you how to include spiritual warfare uh, in uh, these types of altars. All right? So let's pray again. Say, Father God, uh, I enter your gates with thanksgiving. I enter your courts with praise. I present myself to you. Uh, and uh, I come before you to be the second mouth of the double mouth sword and I yield to your Holy Spirit and I give you thanks, praise and glory all in your name now Father I raise an altar uh calling on your name for, and name the person, I'll say Freddy. <clears throat> and this, uh, by the way, for you folks out in the uh, television audience, this does not have to be for drug addiction. It can be for anything that needs spiritual warfare. Uh, so you can name, when we get to that part, whatever you want, okay? I'm just using this as an example. Uh, so I raise this altar on behalf of Freddie and uh, I speak to the altar now in Christ Jesus' name. Altar, your name shall be deliverance from, in, my, in this case it will be drugs for Freddie. Uh, permanently uh, and f 
freeing of his mind from bondage by the faith of God in Christ Jesus' name. Your purpose is to go forth and do battle for him and wage war uh, on his behalf until he is free and uh, to tear down strongholds. The commands I give you are these. One, ambush all strongholds continually, day and night, until you break the will of the enemy to control him. Two, destroy all matrices and every matrix in his mind that controls him. Number three, cut a uh, straight, unobstructed uh, path to his heart, mind, soul, and spirit. And let the light of Christ shine in. Four, bind the strong man on assignment, binding Satan and all under him first. Then bind under the strong man every spirit of addiction, every spirit of perversion, every spirit of mind control, every spirit of witchcraft manipulation, every spirit of witchcraft uh, control every spirit uh, not of the Holy Spirit every spirit of mind binding every spirit of Antichrist and every spirit of self will or will worship and break their powers and ministry off of him and loose him now and permanently in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus as we stand in the gap and repent of all of his sins for him until such time that he can be led to Christ and uh, uh, do it on his own. By the faith of God, in Christ Jesus' name. Fifth, break their powers, communication lines, supply lines, and bind up and off all reinforcements. Sixth, cut off his drug supplies and marijuana supplies. Cut off his finances in means of purchasing them. Cut off all their reinforcements. And cut off all the benefits they give him for doing what he's doing. And cause all of those things to dry up in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus. Sixth, throw their plans for him into continual confusion and disarray. Seventh, cause them to be confused continually and to war against each other and to destroy each other's works continually. Eight, tear down that stronghold permanently, all in Christ Jesus' name. So be these things, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, 
we've done three altars as examples. At the end of every altar, at the completion where the result has manifested, okay, which is according to your faith. Remember what Jesus said. When, so that's a decision. Faith's a decision. You all know that, huh? Uh, why do I say that? Because it doesn't take any more effort to believe than not to believe. It takes the same amount of effort, so you might as well believe. You ever think about it that way? <laughs> nice way to think about it, right? Okay. Now, we've done three of those altars. At the end of each altar, remember what we taught in the previous videos. You always uh, raise an altar to God. Okay, then go back and now get him in the kingdom. Give him the gospel. Once he's in the kingdom, then you can break the demonic altar he was bound to. See, so what you're doing in these intercessions are breaking the altars of bondage so that they can function. So, so that they can see something different. This is, these are altars of grace are what they really are. Say, but they're still going to need to be delivered from the generation's curse after they come to Christ. They can't be delivered before they come to Christ. Say, so you can always include the command during this type of, of raising altars to call on the name of the Lord. You can always include the command uh, for him to hear and receive the gospel from you. Angel of God. Say, and you remember, uh, you're sacrificing this and that angel will continue to minister and minister and minister and minister until he uh, gets the breakthroughs. See? And this is how uh, you uh, uh, utilize or work these altars of intercession. Okay? Now, in our next session, we're going to go a little deeper. And in our next session, we're going to answer the question, what do you do about aggressive altars that resist breaking? There are such things. Okay? Aggressive altars that resist breaking. What do you do about those things? And we're going to show you that. We're also going to show you uh, how to know and test uh, your result if the altar has been broken. Okay? That, uh, uh, that you're, uh, uh, we're talking about the demonic altar in the person that he's bound uh, to. Okay? And we're going to be able to learn how to examine where the person is at, how to know uh, what's going on. Is there any other altar that needs to be erected to go against the stronghold, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Okay? And, you, and hopefully by the end of this uh, uh, teaching, you should be well equipped. Uh, to uh, be able to uh, break most altars. Again, I want to remind you, <clears throat> uh, before we close, that uh, uh, all of the things that we have been teaching, you can find on our website at Walking in Power, all one word, lowercase letters, no spaces, walkinginpower.org. Uh, in the book section, uh, at the home page, scroll up to the top toolbar, look to the right, you'll see the word books. Click on it. It will take you to the book section and look for a book entitled uh, My Chains Are Gone, second edition. 
my chains are gone. And you can freely read it online or you can click the button and download it to your desktop free of charge. And in that book, you can learn all about breaking all kinds of curses and particularly even altars uh, and raising altars to God, uh, which uh, uh, are uh, chapters two and three. Uh, and we hope they'll be a blessing to you. I left a little note in the description section. You might find some typographical errors in there. We are in the process of editing them out and we will be uh, hopefully in the very near future coming out with edition three that'll be totally corrected. I don't know what happened with our spell checker and our word processor, but it missed a bunch of things. And uh, uh, this, with the time being so short before the second coming of Christ and the need being so great, we just decided uh, to release it anyway uh, for use uh, because it in no way interferes with your ability to use the materials. Uh, but uh, uh, I have to get those things corrected just for the sake of honoring the Lord and doing things with excellence uh, uh, on, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of his glory. So uh, please forgive us for that, but I will make the book available because of the need of the moment for everyone. Uh, and uh, uh, if you follow it, just this commands cookbook, you'll see that they will work very effectively. Uh, we've had lots of good reports uh, in the short time that the book has been out. Uh, Father, we give you thanks, praise, glory, honor, and worship for the revelations of this day and for the move of your spirit here. And we thank you uh, for the knowledge that you've brought forth to set the captives free. We bless your name and we give you all the glory. We worship you. We honor you. We praise your holy name. We give you thanks and love and blessings, one with the Lord Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the saints say in agreement, Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Maybe you've been watching and a lot of this stuff is new to you and maybe you don't understand it all. In time, you will if you give your heart to Jesus. The things of the kingdom of God are for the people of the kingdom of God. And I invite you now to pray a commitment prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ to commit your life to him. He will change you. He will bless you. He will give you a great future. Now listen up. This is an important thing for you to know. Jesus takes people with bad pasts and he gives them great futures. Are you ready? Pray this prayer loud. Being willing to turn from your sin, the Lord Jesus Christ will do the rest. And just say these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Every sinner needs a Savior. I need a Savior. So I invite you into my heart to be my personal Lord that is to lead me through life and Savior that is to save me from sin, self, and circumstances. I confess you before men as the resurrected Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I receive you through a trusting faith on you alone. I thank you for the free gift of eternal life, which I can't earn or deserve, but I thank you anyway. Come into me now, Lord Jesus Christ. 
I give you thanks, praise, and glory. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, get yourself into a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational congregation. Get water baptized by immersion. Get Holy Spirit baptized by those who have the baptism in the Holy Spirit in your congregation. And if there are none, go to the New Testament Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, and read it without doubting and ask Father God to baptize you in his Holy Spirit, and he will do so for the asking. Get into Christian community where they can teach you the word of God, and I promise you, my friends, you will never again be the same because the proof that Jesus Christ is real is the testimony of changed lives by the hundreds of millions of those who have received him throughout the centuries. It is self-proving. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for watching. God willing, talk to you next week. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.